Welcome participants or audience to Rosenberg and Parker's second shirt chat. Uh, we're really pleased to have our two fine panelists who I'm going to introduce in a moment and hear from them. Um, as you know, because you've signed up, the title focuses on commercial surety versus contract surety or international surety. Uh, we will do some of those. We will, we will touch on those subjects on a later shirt chat. Stay tuned at suretybond.com on our website. Um, so the title, as you saw, was uh, Commercial Surety, A Cautionary Tale. Maybe it is, maybe it is not. We'll, we'll see what our leaders, our surety leaders say. Uh, I do want to say that um, we know that a lot of people are, there's a lot of things going on in this crazy world of ours right now. Um, and so Rosenberg and Parker wanted to try and help. Um, today, um, we decided we would donate money, $2,500 to Feeding America. And since we have a Canadian office, Food Banks Canada. Um, and if you have any inclination, no requirement, no, no pressure, if you wanna um, donate five, 10, 20, 30 hours or more, uh, you can go to our website, suretybond.com and there'll be a link to Feeding America and to Food Banks Canada. Um, so without further ado, because we have a lot of questions I wanna ask our panelists, um, we have uh, Tim Michael Ajeski from Liberty Mutual Surety, and I'm going to do a brief uh, intro on his bio. And Tim is the executive, and I was giving these guys a hard time because they have long titles. Um, Tim is the executive vice president, global specialty, uh, global specialty, and president Liberty Mutual Liberty Mutual Surety. He oversees all Liberty Mutual Surety operations globally. So he is the top guy. Tim joined Safeco Surety, now uh, Liberty Mutual Surety. We lost Tim, uh, we lost Steve briefly, so I imagine we'll just keep moving. Uh, it might be just a one-on-one -on -one for a few minutes. There we go. Um, no worries, we're good. Tim joined Safeco Surety um, uh, where, when Safeco and Liberty came together, um, and, and Tim sir, uh, started at Safeco in 1984. Um, and in 2006, he was named the senior vice president uh, of the former Safeco surety and then continued on and then eventually to be the lead of Liberty Mutual Surety. Tim is a former board chair of the Surety and Fidelity Association of America, the SFAA as we like to call it. That's the Association of the Surety Companies and a past chair of the SFAA Contract Bonds Advisory Committee. And he currently serves as the executive, um, on the executive committee as well as a trustee for the Surety Foundation. Uh, Tim currently serves on the management committee of the International Credit Insurance and Surety Association. Um, and Tim graduated from the University of Cincinnati with a bachelor's in business administration. And he also holds an MBA from Xavier University. Steve Haney uh, in, in that fine blue color right there. Steve um, was named division from Chubb, he was named Division President, North America Surety and Chief Underwriting Officer, Global Surety for Chubb in 2015. In his current role, Steve has executive operating responsibilities for the commercial and construction surety products and services offered through the North, um, the national accounts, middle market and small commercial business units, units uh, that serve customers in the U.S. and Canada, um, and he has responsibilities globally as well for surety. He joined when uh, it was Ace Surety in 1997, um, and he's the past chair of uh, Board of Directors of the Surety Association of America, Surety, surety and Fidelity Association of America, uh, and is a member of the executive committee as well. And he holds uh, a bachelor's degree in finance from We Are Penn State. From Penn State University. Thanks for that, Matt. You're welcome. Had to throw that in there. Um, so let's get to some questions. And again, appreciate you being here, willing to, to field some questions that we have that we think that risk managers and others have on their mind. Um, I'll just direct the first question to Tim since he's on my top of my screen. Um, Tim, in your opinion, are you bullish or bearish on the state of the surety industry? during these economic times during COVID-19. Thanks, Matt. And uh, first of all, thanks for the introduction and for you know getting my last name right. And also <laughs> for getting the name of my uh, 
where I got my master's degree, Xavier University, right? Because that's not always pronounced uh, accurately as well. So thanks for that. Thank you for the compliment. <laughs> so, um, hey, I've been in the surety industry my whole career, and I'd, I'd be, uh, I'm always going to say I'm bullish on the, on the surety industry. And I, I, I think, uh, you know, the market that we're in today doesn't um, at all uh, make me uh, change from that uh, perspective of being bullish. You know, the industry goes through cycles. Uh, we have cycles where we've had pretty substantial amount of losses uh, in the past. Um, I think uh, we provide a valuable product to uh, the, um, I guess the, I'll call it the economy overall. And when, you know, the times get tough like this, I think it's a great opportunity for our industry to really be there for, uh, you know, what it was intended to be. Um, and I think when you look at some of the longer term economic uh, forecast, uh, you know, post, you know, what I would call just a health event right now, it's not necessarily a real uh, economic event yet, not driven by credit problems or credit challenges, it's really uh, driven by more of a health issue, pretty optimistic. And, and I think uh, most of the investment people that, uh, and that I work with at Liberty that do a lot of work on macroeconomic uh, analysis are, are pretty optimistic that assuming the, the, the health event is relatively short term, that the economic opportunities on the uh, uh, recovery side, if you will, are going to be pretty, uh, pretty positive. So I'm in the bullish. I'm in the bullish camp. Great. Steve, may I direct it to you now? Same question. Yeah, sure. I mean, look, I, I agree with Tim. I'm opportunistic as well. The, uh, you know, the cycle we're in now clearly un unprecedented as far as the, you know, the health issues and, the, uh, and the, what's happened to demand uh, by the consumer being, you know, kind of, you know, locked up at home. So, so, look, there'll be a knock-on effect for sure um, where you're going to see a slowdown, but it's kind of still undetermined on how the consumer is going to respond after, you know, we get more certainty around how we need to operate, you know, in a, in a more normalized environment. So for, for the short term, people are going to be, I think, a little cautious. You know, you saw savings rates go up almost to 30 percent as people kind of, you know, pivot, you know, and, and look after themselves. Um, and then, you know, obviously unemployment, you see that going up. But, you know, from us, you know, from surety specifically, you know, there's a lot of there's a, going to be a lot more demand because of this uncertainty. So, I mean, you know, we're, we're, it came out of nowhere. People are like things can happen. And, and I think the product bringing some, you know, what we'll call, you know, some certainty to projects and to, you know, to companies and to, you know, to the consumer and to the taxpayer, I think there's going to, you might actually see, you know, contrary um, effect, which is people actually buying more surety now, right? Yeah. 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 Seek protection. Um, also, thank you for those the answers to the first question. I, I want to remind everybody or let everyone know, you can also, after I run through about 10 questions, we're going to take questions from uh, our participants. And if you go to your chat feature, you can ask a question and uh, we'll try and get it to the group um, and uh, to the panelists. Um, and no one else sees it except us. So feel free to, uh, to send us your questions through the chat feature. Um, uh, the next uh, question I have for you, I'll start with Steve. Um, how have the current economic conditions changed how your company underwrites your clients and, and any new opportunities? You, you know, I, I, it's, it's interesting. So maybe, maybe the way Steve, to answer that is, Steve, is you nobody answer. builds a business hey, to have only expense and no revenues, right? Yeah. Right. Can you see me? You're, uh, okay, I'm sorry. Just, I'm going to let the participants know who weren't signed up. Steve uh, lost power where he is. So he's sometimes yeah, freezes like he did in the beginning. You're fine now. Would you... Start again, sorry. Yeah, 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 no worries, Matt. So I, I, the way I would answer the question is, uh, you know, have we changed our underwriting? I would say, look, we're just very cognizant of the fact that nobody builds a business model to have only expense and no revenue. So, you know, this pandemic that is, you know, kind of facing the industry has challenged us to kind of be more thoughtful about looking at certain companies where right now with the way everything is, there's, there's not certainty around how, how the, you know, the ending will be. So, 
so yes, we, you know, we certainly changed, you know, I guess our opinion where we can see, you know, certain industries affected, but, you know, by the same token, it's still the basic blocking and tackling that you would do in any underwriting scenario that we're still adhering to. Right. So we try not to be an accordion and stretch too far when it's a good market and contract too far when it's a bad market. But by the same token, you, you can't ignore the fact that, like, for instance, the airlines or the cruise lines have gone from, you know, pretty much normal operations at the beginning of February to, you know, virtually zero revenue. So in those specific segments where it's highly, you know, affected, yeah, we, we've obviously changed our opinion and, and forecast. Right, right. No, fair enough. Understood. Tim, how would you answer that question? Yeah, um, I mean, I'd say the, the, yeah the, the only thing I'd, I'd, I'd probably add to that is that, you know, the underwriting cycle goes on for a long period of time. And if you're um, just starting to take action now, then you're probably way too late in the, uh, uh, in, in the, in the underwriting process to, to really do anything meaningfully. But, you know, to Steve's point, you know, the industry sectors that are the weakest today have been industry sectors that have been uh, weak for uh, several years. And we've been monitoring our exposure. We've been monitoring customers in those uh, weakened industry sectors uh, for the past couple of years and feel, you know, pretty good that we going into this kind of a, a situation that we were, uh, had done all the things already in the past that we needed to, to, uh, to, to minimize exposure or protect uh, you know, that exposure uh, when an event like this um, happened. So uh, we're kind of looking at it a, a little from an opportunistic standpoint as well. Um, you know, there's, you look at most of the top five sureties for sure, um, you know, given the balance sheet strength that those companies have, given the scale that those companies have, uh, you know, there's gotta be an industry coming out of this. And uh, I think most of us are really just looking to be well positioned to take advantage of the opportunities, uh, you know, once we come out of it on the other, uh, you know, in, in a more positive environment. Mm -hmm. And for our participants, the top five sureties are Travelers, Liberty, Zurich, CNA, and Chubb. And, and they represent about 55% of the top 100 writers revenue surety revenue. So we always say never burn a bridge, especially with the top five. <laughs> um, uh, de diving just a little bit deeper into that question. Um, so there have been sweeping downgrades, I would say, from S&P and Moody's of companies, certain business um, segments of the uh, certain industries, right? Um, so during this downturn, have your underwriters, would you say, at times, uh, have, have they had to change terms and conditions of your downgraded clients? Um, would that be fair to say that you're seeing um, a good bit of that on your downgraded clients? Tim, if I asked you that? Sure. Um, you know, I, I guess I would, I think about it this way, Matt, is it's not so much maybe ch changing terms and conditions to necessarily protect us as the surety. But I think we're engaged with our customers much more in analyzing whatever that obligation is for that, uh, you know, mutual customer with the broker and ourselves to, to make sure that they don't enter into uh, or give them some guidance or some perspective uh, before they enter into uh, some sort of exposure uh, or some sort of a commitment that they're, uh, that they're getting into. So we're trying to look at it more from an advisory standpoint versus, um, you know, changing terms and conditions to protect our, to protect ourselves. The other thing that I would comment on there, Matt, is uh, I think the industry for the most part has done a really good job in the last four or five years of investing in, in data, investing in analytics. And there's probably a lot more in the way of sophisticated pricing tools, for example, that are being used in the industry today than there was three or four or five years ago. And quite frankly, those pricing tools are driven by uh, credit quality. And when you see credit quality changes, that has an impact on what those, what those pricing uh, uh, tools may, uh, you know, may show you. Now that doesn't mean you absolutely stick to what those models and those tools say, but they're pretty indicative of 
you know, who some of the stronger uh, companies are in a particular sector and, and, and who might not be. And then it's really working with those that are on the, uh, maybe the lower end uh, from a strength standpoint of, of, of what we can do to help support them in uh, improving whatever situation that they're in. Good, thank you. Steve, what would you, what would you add to that? Yeah, look, I would, I would follow up what Tim said and say, it is true. The industry has improved dramatically in housing off of credit. Uh, so it's an individual that happens. Everybody raises rates, you know, pretty much collectively. But for us, it really is, you know, each balance sheet kind of speaks on its own. And, and it's a good opportunity when to engage with your clients. And this is where you really find out when the clients want to treat you as a partner or not, right? When they're, when they're willing to get on the phone and explain because, you know, if they're under a lot of pressure to try to, you know, either raise capital or figure out where they are. And then, and then look, lastly, it is, it is an obligation driven, you know, event, right? So you have to look at, you know, what the obligations are and what you think those obligations or how they'll perform, you know, if the company has to seek, you know, bankruptcy to protect itself, right? So, you know, it's all, all those are playing out in by company by company. And so you, you, it's fair to say that, you know, terms and conditions are changing. But listen, I wouldn't say that every deal is necessarily and their balance sheets are improving and, and they're getting better terms. Struggling. Um, and to Tim's point, you know, we're trying to, you know, work with them through this, you know, through this process. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, participants, thanks for bearing with uh, Steve's uh, phone. We, again, we appreciate him uh, working off the phone since he lost power, but we, I think we all understood what he was, what he was saying there. Um, so, uh, Tim, um, so we have been by many accounts by uh, people that were in a, what we would consider a soft surety market or have been for the last 10 years or so, whatever period of time you want to, anyone wants to, to put that soft meaning, terms, conditions, pricing, uh, underwriting, very competitive, more and obviously more sureties getting into the market, deciding surety is a great product. Um, and, uh, and who knows if some are gonna have the stomach, if, if it were to, um, if we were to see more surety, see surety losses. But, but my question is, um, many have wondered what's gonna harden the market. And do you see what's happening now, a driving factor for creating a harder surety market, which we haven't seen in some time? Yeah, you know, uh, Matt, and that's something that, uh, that, that we have been talking about for, for, for a couple of years. And, you know, it's always been hard to say exactly when that surety market is going to get get hard. But I kind of think that, that this may be a catalyst that makes the industry uh, and the market a little bit harder than what it has been. And I'll, and I'll answer from a couple of different angles. You know, number one, you know, the, the property and casualty insurance industry, uh, especially in the specialty uh, insurance lines are going to get hit pretty hard by the uh, COVID-19, you know, whether it's event cancellation stuff or business, inter business interruption, there's going to be a lot of, there's going to be a lot of impact to the property and casualty industry. Um, that's going to impact reinsurers as well and those that support uh, the, the industry. And while there's still an abundance amount of capital uh, in the uh, in, in the market, and I think there will be even after dealing with the pandemic uh, losses, um, the reality of it is, is nobody's going to be making the kind of return that they really uh, that, that they really would expect uh, to get. So I, I think you're going to see some outside pressure from a reinsurance standpoint on terms and conditions changing, as well as pricing changes, which are going to therefore impact the primary the, the primary surety so uh i think you know capacity may be a little bit uh, a little bit more uh challenged than it than it has been i think losses are going to drive some of it as well I, I think it's inevitable that we'll have 
uh, losses in the industry. It might not be in 2020, but certainly 2021 and 22, I think that, you know, we'll start to see the, the, the lagging part of, of, of the uh, COVID situation and, and, and that will have some negative impact uh, on the industry. And then a final part of it is just, you know, think about this whole digital world that, that, that we're, we're heading in. I mean, we, I think most insurance companies have been slowly moving along from a digital standpoint, but the reality of it is we've got to move a lot more, a lot more rapidly in that digital investment than we have. And I don't know that there's some, uh, you know, when you get down into some of the sureties that are just doing a few million or 10 or $20 million a year in revenue, whether they're really going to have the appetite to make that kind of invest, investment that they're going to need to, uh, to, to stay relevant, uh, you know, from, uh, from, from a digital standpoint. Right. Yeah, good, good. Appreciate that insight. Steve, let's see how your video audio is working. Yeah, hopefully it'll get better, Matt. I apologize for everybody. No, no, you're fine. So I would say, like Tim's right, I mean, I think, the current environment certainly, it's it certainly slows down. You know the soft market, and a lot of the a lot will depend on you know factors such as you know how the reinsurers behave, and quite frankly, how much loss activity comes out of this period to determine just how hard it gets, right? And then you know because you need capacity to come out of the market, which you know leaves a few players left, and you know in order to be able to maybe drive pricing higher. Uh, and, you know, it's still, you know, to be determined. Um, but, yeah, I would definitely think that you, it would be harder to believe that you would see, you know, more markets sort of having an interest in, you know, what we'll call surety. Because to Tim's point, with the PNC going through its, you know, its pain, usually that will turn around and, you know, generate higher pricing for them, right? And then that'll be more attractive. So capital will flow towards a higher return. Right. So, so one thing I would add to uh, Matt, and I think, you, you know, I'm, I'm sure Steve would agree as well, but, you know, the severity is becoming much more of an issue within surety right now. I mean, the bonds we're writing are much bigger than they've ever been. The complexity around some of the deals that, that, that we're involved in or the industries involved in are, are you know, at the higher end that we've, we've, we've ever seen. And when you do have a problem, um, yeah. You know, those problems seem to be much more severe than, uh, you know, perhaps uh, when we were writing smaller bonds and it was a little bit, you know, less complex uh, obligations that we were getting involved in. Yeah, no, I, I would certainly echo that as we've seen, seen a lot of opportunities where we're replacing letters of credits with bonds and we're navigating through that and they're technical and they're very different than a contract bond and a license yep. and permit bond that we yep. do all day long. And, and as an industry, we're able to do that um, for, for many obligations, certain obligations, certain ones we can't, but, um, but it is interesting to see the, the availability of uh, the surety market and interest for the right credit to, to write those types of bonds. Yeah. Um, so along those lines, and Steve, you touched on it, what would harden the market? Are, are you seeing as a company more surety claims activities? And if so, if you are in any particular industries or geographic regions? So at, at, at the moment, Matt, no, we really aren't seeing uh, a dramatic uptick in any claims activity. But you know, right now, you, it's kind of a quiet period. You would expect to see that towards the back end of the year and into 2021, um, because it'll, it'll take time. Now, look, there's been some events for, you know, you had companies that have filed for bankruptcy, um, most of which are trying to reorganize, which obviously lessens the effect of losses on sureties, right? Is that a help? That's helpful. But um, just from an absolute volume of claims, um, no, we haven't really seen uh, a dramatic uptick as of yet. Yeah, and I would say it's it, uh, fair enough. It's early. Tim, would you would you echo that for now, or are you seeing more? I mean, the question is, are you seeing more claims? Yeah, and and I'd, I'd echo what Steve said. Uh, not yet. Um, really, have not seen um, any activity whatsoever. I'd say related to uh, to the the COVID situation. I mean, we're anticipating that uh, that 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 may change. I think you have to be prepared, whether it changes or not. I think you have to be prepared for the fact that that. Uh, 
there might be a, you know, a, a period of uh, 18 months or 24 months where we do see increasing claims activity. And I mean, some of it's you know, driven by, I mean, a lot of questions around the impact that the supply chain disruption is going to have, uh, you know, longer term uh, on the, uh, the U.S. economy. Um, mm -hmm. You know, companies and uh, uh, countries really that are dependent on, on energy and, and oil and gas as a, as a main driver of, uh, of tax revenue, uh, you know, the, all the states that, that rely on tax revenue dollars for, um, uh, in, in oil and gas for you know, their infrastructure improvements. So th there's a lot of dynamics that are going on, Matt, that, that I think, you know, in total, um, it's just inevitable that, that there's going to be some uh, longer term impacts on uh, the, uh, you know, the, the, the commercial surety as well as the contract surety uh, market over the next 12 to 18 months. So we fully yeah. anticipate that there will be an increase in claims activity. Yeah, and you know what, you, you wouldn't expect to see them now. To, to, Tim had made this comment earlier where, you know, people have been thoughtful about, you know, the environment that we're in and been underwriting, right? So un unless you really were underwriting pretty weak credit. Hmm. We're losing Steve again a little bit. Losing a little steam. Companies to fail, you know, only two and a half months into this, right? It's going to take some time. Oh, I'm sorry. That's okay. We now got. We now got. It's going to take some time. Yeah, I, 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 like to finish the thought. I was going to say it, it, the underwriting has been pretty decent, so you wouldn't expect a lot of failures right now. Right. Agree. All right, you're both heads, global heads of surety as well, and that's a growing market. I think you both would agree uh, that your global um, footprint, you'd like to see it grow, and you are seeing it grow. Uh, I know both companies, I, I know Chubb's been a global surety partner of ours for a very, very long time, and Liberty's a growing uh, global partner of ours. Um, so Steve, you there? Yeah, can you hear me? I can. So are any regions impacted um, dramatically, Latin America, Europe, Asia, anything that you're seeing that's impacted more than others than, you know, than the U.S.? So, I mean, it, like it started first in Europe, right? And then obviously with Italy being the most dramatic, so there's certainly been a slowdown there. Um, people expect some recession. So, you know, they're going to be a slowdown in opportunities a little bit. Do, do we see that? Not at the moment. And then as you move, um, you know, east to west, you know, it hit the United States. We start, we saw our response has been. And now, you know, now it's in, in Mexico, who just reopened kind of this week. Right. And, um, and then, you know, it, all the way down into Brazil, which are kind of the two big markets in Latin America. You know, Brazil's getting, you know, has a lot of cases and, and, and severity of cases is pretty high, but you know, that market is dominated by, you know, tax appeal, right? So there really hasn't been a construction market. So the, it's not really impacting, um, impacting that segment. And, and in tax appeal with the courts kind of like sort of soft right now are not hundred percent open. You don't see an uptick in losses. So, you know, it's, again, it's going to, you're going to have to see what happens. Like most of these economies, Matt, have, you know, you know, like Matt in America has, they've been in recession, you know, like Mexico's coming out of a weak market. Brazil's coming out of a weak market. So this will most likely just kind of stall or, or lengthen that period of time before they can get back, you know, to, uh, you know, growth mode again. So that's kind of the way we're looking at it right now, but we're hopeful that, you know, they don't fall in, you know, into the, you know, into, into an abyss which we don't, we don't think will happen. Tim, how do you th see things globally for Liberty Mutual Surety? Yeah, you, you know, and, and echo a lot of what Steve said. I mean, a few other things I'd, you know, in, in Europe, you already had a few countries where the economies were struggling a little bit, uh, you know, going into this. So how they recover longer term, um, I think is still a big question mark. And then you, you, you throw in the dynamics around the Brexit uh, going forward and the disruption that that was going to cause within Europe to begin with. So in addition, you know, you got a few of those, th th those issues that 
uh, didn't really need a, a, a pandemic on, on top of it. Um, you know, in Latin America as a whole, you know, you're kind of got a little bit of a double whammy, if you will, in the sense that uh, with the pressure in the, uh, in the oil prices and the energy sector, which so much drives the, the, the revenue of so many countries in Latin America. And then you've got this on, uh, on top of it, uh, which um, uh, as, as well as some really developing markets in um, Latin America, which, which really haven't been big surety markets in the past, but now they're becoming bigger surety markets. So you've got a little bit of untested uh, uh, legal system when it comes to surety and you've got a lot of on-demand type products. So it doesn't take a whole lot from a cash flow disruption to see you know, activity in, in that market kind of pick up a little bit. Um, you know, the Asia PAC region really hasn't been that big from a surety standpoint to, be, to, to begin with. So, um, you know, I don't think we're going to see a lot there. Um, you know, other than maybe the, you know, longer term, you know, the product, the surety product is viewed uh, maybe more positively uh, uh, in, in that Asia PAC region and, and the usage of, of surety uh, hopefully ticks up if the industry handles the situation well. Right. Do you see uh, Asia PAC growing anytime soon for Liberty? So, you know, Liberty has a big investment on the, uh, you know, th throughout the Asia PAC region, uh, primarily in the uh, personal insurance space. Um, you know, we've kind of, we meaning the specialty lines businesses have kind of followed into some of those markets, Matt, and I'd say probably the biggest concentration has been on the multinationals versus the local businesses throughout the Asia PAC region. Um, I suspect over time that, uh, you know, that, that, that may change, but right now the focus has really been more on the, uh, on the personal insurance sector and not necessarily some of the bigger complex uh, commercial, unless it is a multinational where we have a global relationship. Steve, what are you seeing in Asia? Yeah. I mean, Matt, you know, our, our focus has been largely in Australia and that market, you can't write commercial direct. You have to kind of behind the banks. So that limits your potential. And then we have like to, to Tim's point, we have, we always support a lot of larger multinational construction firms down there. So, uh, you know, it's so spread out and it's so dominated by the banks, you know, that you, you tiptoe in and you support the clients that, you know, and, uh, you know, so I wouldn't see a dramatic uptick, um, you know, in growth coming out of that out of that region for surety, right? You know, the other PNC lines, you know, obviously that's that's a different story. I couldn't speak to it, but right. definitely surety's probably more, you know, steady as she goes. And Steve, I have a good connection with you. Has has there been an uptick um, on the need for your underwriters to call on collateral? or extend offers to any new clients that might include partial, partial or full collateral? Would you say there's more of that than before? You know what, there, there's certainly an opportunity now in the segments that have got, you know, that have really been dramatically affected by COVID from a demand perspective, where we would be looking for some certainty and you have some conversation, but it goes back to an earlier point, you know, you're, you're asking for collateral on obligations where you feel might not survive if they needed to go into bankruptcy, you know, where you really are, you know, uh, it's a pure liability. So there's been some of it, Matt, um, maybe not as much as everybody thinks, but certainly, you know, you know, if you look at some of the segments where there's, like I said, where there's certainty, there's so much anxiety and uncertainty around the, you know, the near term future that, you know, you'd be asking for collateral or, you know, and quite frankly, not necessarily collateral, maybe just asking them to use, um, you know, to take, you know, surety out of the equation for the time being or do something, right? So we're just trying to find the right solution and collateral isn't always the right solution, um, but it is, it is right in some cases. And yes, we have, we've asked for it in a, few time, in a few situations. And for the most part, the clients have been, been accommodating, right? And, you know, we've done it and we've not, like every, like I said, every deal has been unique, but you know, it, it helps. And, and then again, that's a good partner, right? That's looking for the longer term. Yeah, every, I mean, that, that we all know that every deal is unique and every, yeah. every situation, it always, you, you sometimes feel bad saying it depends when you're asked a question, but it always, there's so many factors. I mean, 
I will say this. I'll follow up and then I'll let Tim, you know, give his thoughts on it. But, you know, look, I've, by asking for collateral, sometimes you can do a lot more harm and cause companies to, you know, fall into, you know, bankruptcy much quicker. I mean, you can go back. So, you know, we're trying to be thoughtful about it, you know, and engage in dialogue and understand the business plan, understand the likelihood, you know, that they will go into bankruptcy and what they think about surety and how it'll be treated. So all that factors into, you know, how you behave and, and you know, in the terms that you put out for the client, right? Right. Tim, how would you answer that question? Yeah, and I, and I you know, uh, say that we, yeah, there's definitely been situations where we've uh, asked for uh, increase in collateral. And I think the one clarification I'd make there is that these weren't surprise decisions to anybody that was involved. You know, these were ongoing conversations that have been taking place primarily in, in, in industry sectors that are, that, that are weakened and have been weakened for the last couple of years. And, and I think there's been open and transparent dialogue around, hey, if certain things happen, you know, we, we, we may want to protect our interest uh, more so than, than um, uh, without collateral. Uh, so, yes, the, you know, the answer to that is realistically, as the markets have, as some of the credit markets and industry sectors have deteriorated, you know, we've had those conversations. And I think, as Steve said, and, and as you mentioned as well, Matt, um, you know, all of those are case by case situations because uh, it's, it's not a blanket across the board. Cl collateral is the best solution in every every situation. I mean, the last thing we want to do is create uh, a claim for ourselves. And sometimes you may, uh, by your actions you're taking, you may end up doing that. So we'd rather partner uh, with whoever that customers to come up with a solution that works best for all parties involved and it gives everybody the opportunity to kind of survive whatever crisis they're going through. Yeah, and this, most people think about cash or letter of credit and collateral isn't just always those two forms um, of security. There are other forms of collateral where you don't hurt your company's liquidity position, but gives you, you know, a secured, you know, position if they were to go into bankruptcy, right? So, you know, again, it's, it's definitely, you just work every individual circumstance and without harming yourself or your client. Yeah. Tim, I'm going to ask you this question and keep in mind we're, we want to ask a few more questions and take some questions from the audience because this could go the rest of the time for each of you. Yeah. Um, but I still think it's a valuable question, even though it's a little bit of a softball layup question, but what advice would you give to any risk manager or business owner today to maximize their company's surety facility? You know, probably not a big surprise, uh, Matt, because I think you and your organization do the same thing. I mean, the, the transparency and dialogue uh, is absolutely at the top of, um, I think, any um, maximization of surety uh, support. You know, we're, we don't deal with surprises very well as an industry, but we we deal with facts and, and we understand that um, you know things happen during you know during the course of an economic cycle or during the you know the, the, the course of a, of a business cycle for a particular customer. So um, I think the big thing there is just being as open and transparent uh, with what you're trying to accomplish. And, and you know I think the surety industry has a phenomenal amount of talent overall. Uh, you know that that understands a lot of industries and can give some really, really good, valuable insight if we understand what the challenges and what the issues are. So uh, I would say have confidence in the industry, have confidence in, you know, advice that, that uh, the industry can give uh, and be open and transparent of what you're trying to accomplish and, uh, and, and work together to get there. Mm -hmm. Steve, again, it's a little bit of a softball question, but well, Tim's right, Matt. I mean, that's what it is. I mean, you would expect to be treated as a, you know, a partner and not necessarily as a commodity, you know, and then, you know, when you're extending, you know, millions or tens of millions or even hundreds of millions of dollars of credit, you know, if things are not going well, then we should, you know, you need to communicate that. Um, and then you also need to communicate, you know, the way you think you're going to move forward. And, and that's really, you know, what we look for. Yeah. Um, so do you think that, um, do you expect your company will have less in-person meetings? You know, obviously we're, we're, we're 
We're speaking from home um, and um, actually intended to speak from my office, as you two know, but I lost power in the office. Uh, so here I am. Um, and, and I think people find it interesting. I, I find it interesting at times to, to see this, but uh, people's homes. But do you think, uh, how do you see it going back to some kind of normalcy? And not just, uh, not just in the office right now, which we can get to, but ju just in-person meetings. Because we all talk about relationships. We just talked about it. We find that insurance, insurity, everyone says their business is relationship, but we find that no other business is more relationship-oriented than surety bonds. Um, the surety bond industry and extending credit, right? I mean, you, you folks fly all around the world to meet with clients and um, on a regular basis. Uh, it's obviously weird for you, probably unusual not to, to and you've probably gotten used to it now because it's been so long, but uh, you almost forget what it's like and what it's going to be like to get back to the TSA lines and whatnot. But uh, do you think there's going to be, has this changed things a little bit as far as when you look at your expenses and the necessity for meetings, will it make you look harder at when to have in-person meetings and when a Zoom, WebEx, Teams, whatever you call it meeting, uh, it would probably suffice. Steve, how would you answer that? Uh, you know what, Matt, I, you'd have to say yes, right? It's gonna, it's gonna change the landscape. Um, people, like, look, three months ago, I couldn't even turn on WebEx. I couldn't tell you how to use it, and now, you know, I'm a regular uh, user of it almost every day and, and quite, you know, quite comfortable with it. And it does connect people, you know, reasonably cheaply, right? Um, and I don't feel people are missing out. And then, you know, the next part is like, wh like, when will people be comfortable, like traveling again or meeting again? You know, it's better now to do it digitally than to sit in a conference room with a mask on or a shield. That would be, that would be awkward, right? So, you know, I think going forward, you know, we'll definitely go back to, you know, travel and it'll be, you know, we'll want to meet with people that want to be entertaining, but there, I think now that some of this is going to stick, right. You're going to see, you know, a, a certain portion of these meetings now being done through this digital format, as opposed to just getting on a plane, you know, because I can, right. Or I'm trying to build my air miles or whatever the circumstances are. And Tim, if you agree with some of those thoughts, um, and maybe you don't, but if you did agree with some of those thoughts, do you think people are going to have to have more of a case as to why it's necessary to go to London or why it's necessary to go across the country? Um, what are your thoughts? Yeah, no, no, I, absolutely. And I, I do agree with what Steve uh, has, has commented on. And, you know, the, just a little personal story for me, my, my youngest daughter was in the process of uh, interviewing for, uh, to get into graduate school during the March and April time frame, and she was talking about the Zoom application that she was using. I'm like, I have no idea what that is. Uh, now, you know, in the month of May, I don't know how many hours I've logged on Zoom. So, uh, you know, it's like Steve said, you know, you quickly adapt to the tools that uh, in the environment that you, that, that you have to work in. But one area, uh, Matt, that there's no question, at least from our standpoint, is a lot of internal meetings within Liberty are going to be looked about, you know, looked at a lot differently. I mean, I, as a global company, it's easy for people just to decide, hey, you know what, I need to spend a couple of days in London and meet with, you know, somebody internally for, you know, uh, maybe a day and a half or so, or maybe you justify it making it a day and a half because you really only need to meet for a half a day. So, uh, you know, you hop on a plane, you go to London and you, you, you make that happen we're really going to look a lot more closely about um, you know, when it comes to travel, uh, especially on the internal travel, how much of that do we need to do going forward and how much more can we leverage the technology to stay in touch with our own colleagues, participate in the right kind of meetings with the right kind of engagement um, on in, internally uh, and not necessarily hop on an airplane and, and incur that kind of cost to do it. I think when it comes to our broker relationships and our customer relationships, it's going to be, a, you know, driven a little bit by what the market wants, you know, what, what they, you know, what, what the brokers and what the customers want. But I agree with Steve. I don't think anybody's going to be real, you know, real happy sitting around with, you know, personal protective equipment on and, 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 you know, flying somewhere to not be able to go out and, and, and maybe have a little entertainment after, 
uh, you know, you have a, a, a tough meeting or a good meeting, whatever, whatever it might be. So um, I, I think people are going to be cautious and wait till the right time uh, to be able to, to, to do that. I think that we've been productive up to this point, And I think we've, you know, there's been some deals that have come together that we're pretty excited about. I don't know how sustainable it is to do it completely um, in, a, in a virtual environment long term. Yeah, and you know what? Uh, and then one last thing, Matt. Too, you know, there's certain like for Tim and I, it might be different, but for younger people who need some mentoring, you know, yeah. they're, they're the ones missing out on the the benefit of uh, being in an office, right? right? I think we have to we have to be cognizant of that. Yeah, well, and and we all know that the, those in the the side the side conversations can be just as valuable as the get to business meetings, uh, uh, get to the meeting where you're just getting to business and then you're off, you know? Sure. So, um, you know, how would we learn more about hip surgery if we didn't have the pre- There you go, well, I'm gonna start a blog. You're gonna learn had, from me on, on my blog. Yeah, some of them missed if you signed on, you know, you didn't sign on five minutes early. No, no, um, Matt, I, and, and I was using it just to pick up on one of your examples. I was using an example this morning, I mean, I don't, I, how many good ideas and good solutions come together because you have to be walking by somebody's office and you say, you know what, do you, do you have 10 minutes just for me to run a quick idea by you and you do that informally and you end up with a, you know, a really good perspective and a really good solution to something maybe you've been struggling with. Unless you have everybody on your screen <laughs> digitally, you know, it, it, it's hard to kind of have those types of interactions. And then uh, to, to Steve's point, I think companies need to have specific culture. And I think that culture is really, you know, people grow into a culture and they learn a culture from being around people that buy into that culture and understand that culture. And again, it's a little bit more challenging to do that when you're, uh, you know, when you're a hundred percent virtual. Mm -hmm. Cool, agree. Uh, I will remind the audience one more time. If you want, we're receiving questions from, your chat feature or your, seems like the Q&A feature on your uh, Zoom that you uh, can feel free to also ask a question. I'll only ask a couple more and then I'll, I'll field some of these questions uh, that we've received, but please feel free uh, to, uh, to do that. Um, and, and by the way, if we do go over and some of you have a hard stop soon or, um, or, or right at uh, the hour, um, on top of the hour. This will be on suretybond.com, our website, and uh, this has been recorded. It will be available. Our previous one will also be available that uh, my brother Chad Rosenberg did with uh, Dave Cooper, which was very interesting. And um, um, so, so they will both be available. You could pass it on to any colleagues, uh, any risk managers, uh, anyone who you think could find value in this, or if you want to listen to it again because it was so darn good, you can listen to it again. I mean, that's that's the beauty of technology here, um, which you can't necessarily get in an in-person meeting, right? <laughs> um, so, um, so we, we maybe just just a, a, a little bit on uh, for your own workforce. Uh, do you see, I mean, some companies really have taken to remote working. Some of us feel like remote workers because we're not in the office a lot. Anyway, we're traveling. The three of us are traveling quite a bit. But, but for most people in the office, um, in your respective offices, home offices, branch offices, do you see what's going on here? Changing how big of a footprint you will have? Just, um, people maybe coming in a few days a week, a couple days a week. Um, will will that change, Tim? Do you see that changing uh, how Liberty Mutual Surety would work? Uh, yeah, I don't think there's any question, Matt, that that, that will we, we will. I think we've definitely identified jobs that can be done very effectively from a home environment. Um, so I think we're going to be much more open-minded to those jobs uh, being uh, you know work from home or working virtually. I think you know we have to look. You know, we have a lot of offices where we have six or seven or eight uh, uh, surety employees. And, uh, you know, in those offices where you're mixing in with a lot of different um, other companies that maybe have similar uh, concerns around employee health and safety, or maybe they don't. I mean, how much do you want to expose your employees to that? So 
Um, I, I definitely see us taking advantage of the opportunity to uh, to, to, to move some of those uh, into a uh, into a work from home environment. Mm -hmm. Steve, would you echo that? Yeah, I, I think I think you're going to see a, 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 the landscape change, and you know, at a minimum, there'll be more people working from home, either you know, partially or you know, like Tim said, if the the job really does re doesn't require interaction, then maybe full time. But definitely, like you know, so many days a week remotely, and so many days a week maybe in an office, and it'll be more structured that way. Um, yeah, it, it, it uh, clearly short term, it has to be that way until, you know, there's some kind of normalcy around the, the office environment um, because you can't socially distance in elevators and in, in offices as easily as you can at home. Um, and then, and then, you know, every company will decide how, how, you know, they want to do it. And, you know, and most likely like what Chubb is doing is, you know, we're putting out a survey, like, you know, to our people, like how comfortable are you coming back? You know, like, you know, and, and just trying to engage them and, and see what kind of, you know, thoughtfulness you get out of it and I'll be surprised you'd be surprised that a lot of people are putting real effort into giving their thoughts on how this should be you know it should be going forward for the near term and the longer term so yeah yeah we and we've started our own task force just just to really start to explore how it will look uh, I'm going to take a question from our audience here our participants it's from the new Re New England region um, could you two elaborate on how the tightening of the PNC market could affect reinsurance and cause the surety market to tighten. And what inning, using a sports, a baseball term, what inning would you say we are in, in the reinsurance hardening? Any of you want to? Yeah, I'll, I mean, you want me to jump in, Tim? Sure. You, yeah, listen, I, I would tell you uh, from the, the interactions that I have, you know, the reinsurers in the general PNC market are definitely tightening up terms and condition and pricing. Um, and that will definitely influence the reinsurance uh, for surety, right? Um, how much, you know, that gets company by company based on your results and every, everybody's program is a little different. So it's, I wouldn't want to make you know, too general, but you know, you're probably, it's early innings, right? Because, you know, last year for people who go out and purchase reinsurance, it started to, you know, tighten, right? Because of the events, so the reinsurers are paying losses and, and they want to get, and an adequate return on their capital. So, you know, now with this environment that we're in, and I mentioned this earlier, you know, it, it, a lot of it will depend on how much loss activity comes out of it and how quickly, um, you know, will depend on how much, you know, you see as far as change. The last time that I saw, you know, when you go back to Enron, the reaction from the reinsurers then was very dramatic. And they basically put in terms and conditions and, and it applied it to everybody. It didn't matter whether you were on Enron or not on Enron, everybody kind of got it. And then for a long time, you know, a long, long time, you didn't see, you saw what I'll call softening conditions, softening pricing. Um, and now there's a moment in time where I think the reinsurers are going to try, you know, to get back some of that pricing and terms and conditions. So, but it's, it's, early, it's early days for sure. Mm -hmm. Tim? Yeah, and, and the one thing that I'd add to what uh, Steve said is, is that, you know, one of the things that is driving or will drive, I think, the, uh, the, the, the tightening in the reinsurance as a result of the property and casualty is this event affects the entire world and affects literally every industry where, you know, think about it from the standpoint, if you had a natural disaster of some sort, it's usually specific to a particular area, a particular region. Um, they've got plenty of models that have been built to kind of tell them what, you know, what the outcome of that kind of event's going to be. Um, but never have we had something that has impacted, you know, every country in the world, you know, basically every industry in the world and what the impact of that's going to be from a, from a loss standpoint. So um, I, I do think you're going to see negative or capital go out of the industry uh, over the next couple of years yet to be determined how much, but after many, many years of capital, new capital either being generated by profits in the industry or new capital coming in, I think you see some capital exit uh, the industry overall over the next couple of years as, or, as or, more as a result of losses more than anything else. Mm -hmm. yeah. And by the way, for those who are much younger than Steve, Enron was uh, back in 2002 
somewhere brewing there. Is that, is that correct? Is that, yeah, it was at the, uh, uh, right at, it was like, yes, that's exactly right. The end of 2001, Matt. Right. Um, uh, I have another question here. Um, it said, Steve, you had mentioned collateral isn't always cash or letters mm -hmm. of credit. So the question was, what other forms of collateral have you accepted? And have you been willing to accept lines on assets as collateral or liens, liens on assets as collateral? I mean, yeah, yes, I, I would say, you know, we have done that. It's not, it's not the general normal course that you would do, but in these circumstances where you're trying not to harm liquidity of a company and you want some, you know, what I'll call security, if they go into bankruptcy that you're not unsecured, um, so maybe the, the, psych the psychology of uh, the bankruptcy changes in your favor or, you, you know, if you had to liquidate an asset, you know, although you might pay, you would recover. Um, you know, there's, you know, physical property, um, you know, and, you know, in the past, uh, even aircraft like United just recently went out and tried to use aircraft to secure additional financing. So there's plenty of different types of collateral you could get your hands on that would just give you some comfort. And if they offer you that collateral, generally, you know, they're, you know, they're treating you as a partner and, and really the likelihood of you suffering a claim probably in the bankruptcy are probably, you know, smaller, right? As opposed to them just saying, I'm not giving you anything uh, and they're gonna just go into a bankruptcy and you're gonna suffer a loss. So, so you know, we've been, you know, we've been creative and trying to do that, um, you know, and like I said, it could be physical property, it could be, you know, and a lot of different types. Tim, are you saying anything different? No, I think Steve, I think Steve handled it pretty well. And I think the whole question around liens is, is absolutely, you know, if, if you have the opportunity to, to, to get the lien rights against some asset uh, that protects, you know, the, the interest, then, then absolutely we, we would, you know, in the right situation and the right circumstance working with our, uh, the broker and the customer on it, you know, absolutely you'd look at that kind of an option. Uh, we have a question, of course, this is an international uh, uh, audience here. So we have a question from Mexico um, and they would like to ask the panelists your perspective on uh, their country's, in this case, her country's surety market and your economic outlook in particular for Mexico. Yeah, I mean, you, you know, I, I, I could tell you there was a lot of anxiety of how Mexico was going to perform. Um, and so far, you know, I, I do think that, you know, the, the president has kind of redirected infrastructure spend away from things that we were, you know, anticipating, like the airport. And now he's doing the Mayan and he's doing a petrochemical. So it's not it's it's not you know, I'll call it, you know, robust, but it's not as bad as people would have imagined. Um, but Mexico is dependent on the United States. So a lot of the future in the near term will depend on how quickly the United States recovers, right? The, the one area that I am fearful for in Mexico, and it's not an area that surety provides a lot of um, capacity to, is that the tourism, is tourism industry, that'll, that'll be, it's a big and it's an important component of Mexico. Um, and I think that's going to struggle uh, in the near term. So, um, but generally, you know, manufacturing, you know, and exports to the U.S. still to be determined, you know, infrastructure, um, we'd like to see more of it in Mexico, but it's, you know, like I said, it's, it's just taking a different, a different, you know, complexion right now. Tim, any comments on Mexico? Yeah, you know, one thing that I'd say is that um, I've always been um, impressed by the fact that the Mexican economy is ultimately a pretty resilient <laughs> economy. And there's, there's always been, there's been, seems like every year, every, uh, every cycle, there's a lot of, uh, you know, tough expectations out of Mexico economically, but it, it does seem to uh, be a pretty resilient um, economy. I, I think there's a huge opportunity for investment. Uh, in Mexico going forward. And especially when you look, I've, I've always been, a, and this is not a political statement, but I've always been a big fan of investing in the Americas. And I think as you think about some of the supply chain disruption and some of the challenges that, um, you know, uh, that, that that has posed as a result of this pandemic, you know, I'd like to see a big investment in North and South America and, and have the Americas really Kind of rely on each other from the, the, the standpoint of 
of um, you know supporting each other economically and and, and trading with each other uh, in a in a real positive way. That's a win win for, for for all parties involved. So you know I think if the political leaders get together, that that Mexico would be right at the top of one of those untapped uh, economic uh, opportunities that, uh, that that the world has out there. Well, being mindful of time, I'm going to throw out one more question to you since we we're at the three o'clock hour. And so I'll start with Steve. Steve, as you sit there today, um, what keeps you up at night? You know, Matt, it's always the black swan, right? So, you know, three months ago, we would have said, um, you know, what are you worried about a recession? I'm like, nah, not so much, you know. You know, we can deal with a recession. It's a slow down. People are prepared for it. It's always what we're not prepared for that just comes out, right? Like a, like a, a pandemic, you know, that kills, you know, consumer demand. Um, it, it's what you don't know. And I, I, I you know, just I, I worry about that because, you know, you take so many precautions. You're, you know, you try to be thoughtful in your underwriting, but you, you can only do, you know, or play your cards the way you think the environment is going to be. Um, and when you get thrown like a, you know, a wild card, you know, you just sometimes, you know, unfortunately you can be a victim. And I always worry about that, right? So, so it's, it's that, it's that unknown unknown. So that's what keeps, right. sometimes keeps me up worrying, worrying. Tim, how about you? What keeps you up at night? Yeah, so I think, um, you know, the most immediate thing, uh, which wasn't on my radar, as Steve said at the beginning of the, at the, beginning of the year, is the uh, pandemic situation. And, you know, the concern is really just how long is this going to, uh, to, to last? You know, I think there, maybe we were all optimistic that, uh, you know, when um, the economic engines started to turn down or turn off, that it was going to be rather severe, but it was going to be a, a pretty sharp B and that the recovery was going to be pretty quick. Uh, and, and I don't think that's going to be the case now. And, and the longer the pandemic kind of stretches into uh, July and August, my concerns get a little bit uh, more intense around, you know, there's a lot of businesses that aren't going to be able to survive it, you know, the longer that it, that it, um, uh, that it goes on. So that's the biggest thing right now, Matt, that uh, in the short term that, 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 that keeps me up. And then longer term are some of the things that we've already talked about. And, you know, that is, what is our work environment going to look like going forward? You know, what is the employee experience going to be at Liberty Mutual Surety? And, you know, are we going to be able to uh, you know, make sure that we're making the right decisions to support our brokers and customers and also give our employees, you know, something that they can feel pretty good about with an organization and, a, uh, you know, in an environment and a culture that they enjoy working in. So that, that's, that's a little bit more of a longer term concern that I have. Yeah, that's fair. Yeah. Well, you've said it all. I appreciate it. Appreciate your time. Appreciate participants dealing with some of our technical difficulty, but we got through it. Um, Thanks, Matt. And uh, really appreciate everyone, uh, both of you uh, participating. Uh, means a lot to me that you were doing it. So um, really appreciate it. So uh, till next time, uh, Steve, uh, Tim, have a great day. Have a great summer. And um, everyone, again, can, can visit our website to see this again and stay tuned for our next shirt chat uh, coming soon. Yep, so everyone stay well. Thanks, Matt. Appreciate the invitation. Thanks, Matt. Yep, yep, thanks for your participation, everybody. Yep. Thank you. Take care. Take care.